Hey guys, it's Luciano Sable with Aspiring Hollywood with another special guest right here in our North Hollywood studios, Mr. Patrick Gorman. Welcome to the show. Thank you, my pleasure. Let's talk about acting. What do you say? Well, first of all, you know, I am a journeyman actor. I've been in SAG for over 50 years and AFTRA for at least 40 and all the, all the actor unions. And uh, I vote for the Oscars. I'm just not famous yet. Well, you know, you, you've done, what, over 70 titles? And you mentioned a few minutes ago that, uh, you know, you have more than that, right? Yes, on the famous IMDb. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, projects that I've done are not listed, I guess, from the past because I started. But you, it's fine, you know. Yeah. It's, it's great. I'm, I've done a little bit of everything yeah. from being on, on stage to being a circus clown. <laughs> I danced with Judy Garland in her act, toured the country, and played the Palace Theater. And, uh, T tell, me, tell me about Judy Garland. She was, she was great. Uh, we, we all loved her. Uh, performing with her, I, I watched her perform every night when I wasn't on stage with her. And uh, it was an incredible experience. She, she had, sometimes we had to talk her on stage, she would be insecure, but when she got on stage, ah, she could do anything with an audience. The opening night of the Palace Theater was an incredible experience because I taped, back in those days it was only audio tape, not visual. When we, there were a bunch of us guys who were called her boyfriends who danced and sang and danced and brought her on. And the applause started and it was over 12 minutes of applause. Oh, we were wow. standing vamping, 12 minutes. Now, if you've been on stage, a minute of applause is an eternity. 12 minutes is unreal. And almost every night, not 12 minutes every night, but every, every performance, she'd have at least five minutes or so of Continuous applause. The audiences loved her, and she was she was great to work with. I I, um, I danced with Sammy Davis Jr. and Donald O'Connor, and I've worked with famous people my whole life. And uh, great experience, lots of stories, of course. But uh, dancing with Donald O'Connor was an experience because he could he was really incredible, and he could dance so fast. Now I was a good tap dancer. And there was another guy, he and I did a challenge number with him in his nightclub act. And when he was feeling his oats, he would just sort of slow down and increase the speed, testing our limits. It, was, it wasn't done in a, in, a, in a mean way. It was fun. But we had to work. We here we're working so hard, and he's just looking like nothing is happening. <laughs> the audience can't tell. He didn't break a sweat. <laughs> no, he didn't break a sweat. But... Um, those were, those were great days. I started as, I always wanted to be an actor. At the age of four, I played a 70-year-old. I played Geppetto in a children's production of Pinocchio. And I knew all the lines. And I remember standing on stage, and it was in a big theater. It was a big production with costumes, music, dialogue, everything. And I had a little mustache and octagonal-shaped glasses and a white wig. And I remember the lights hitting me, and I could feel the audience out there. And I knew they were waiting for me to do something. So I knew from that moment on that that's what I wanted to do. But because I grew up, my mother was a dancer and I grew up in a dance school. Uh, so I danced and that was my kind of entree into acting. I always wanted to be an actor, but to be a good dancer, you have to be an actor. Anyway. Sure. Yeah. A that showman. Just, yeah. Yes, a showman. Yeah. And so that's how I, I acted in various projects. I didn't become a union member until I was like 18 or so. I think it was AGVA, the first union. So and I've been a member of all the unions. I am still. Yeah. And as I'm looking at you right now, you have that Clint Eastwood type of look about you. <laughs> Did anybody else tell you that? No, I, I get that from time to time. I once had a dinner with uh, Clint Eastwood and a, a friend of mine. We were trying to pitch a script for him. But he's much taller, much broader shoulders, and uh, so, but I, it's nice to be compared anyway. <laughs> <laughs> now, you mentioned earlier before we started rolling that, you know, your appearance as an actor, right, makes mm -hmm. a whole lot of difference. And, and you mentioned that if you look, if you don't look the same in every single project, then that could be a, a bad thing. Well, 
it's not necessarily a bad thing. If you looked at my demo reel, or if you looked at the series of films that I've done on television over the years, I look very different in all of them. For it's really better to be branded as one thing. When you think about the, your your favorite actors, you have a look. They have a look that suits whatever they do, and that's what they're known for. Uh, being a journeyman actor, it has its advantages, but in a way, I've had the experience where I've done something, and I come into the office, and they may even know me, but because I had a beard or because I had a totally, they don't recognize you. Right. Right. That's not so good. <laughs> I once was playing a role of a, when I was in my 30s, playing a 60-year-old with not much makeup, just a suggestion of, and I was called in by the producer for an interview. And when I showed up, he said, oh, no, no, I, was, I wanted to see Patrick Gorman, who played the old Gabo, right. in a Shakespearean. <laughs> he couldn't believe that I was the same person. Right. So right. that was nice in a way, but... Anyway. But look, I want to talk to you um, about acting in Hollywood. Aspiring Hollywood, as we discussed earlier, yes. is really about the, the, the struggling actor and artist. You know, it could be a, a filmmaker, producer, screenwriter, yes. uh, so forth. Now, regarding acting, what does it take to make a living as an actor in Hollywood? Well, a lot of hard work, of course. When, when you arrive here or... I, it was a little different for me because I had people in the business. I knew about the business, but many young people who come here, or maybe not so young, who are going to start out, uh, have a misconception of the business. And the only thing I can say is, before they come, read as much as you can about the business to understand that. There, there's all these acting schools, and that's great, fine, that's your craft, but there's no school, or very few, that teach you about the business. And it's, in, it's crucial. Now, when I started out, I, didn't, I worked enough that I didn't pay attention so much to the thing that every businessman has to, the networking, what you do, how you put yourself out there, all those things, the lists, people to contact, how to do that. So when you arrive here, uh, hopefully you have your acting skills you have your craft in hand. And, and for me and for everyone, I think it's a constant learning process. Uh, I, I, I still train. That is, I don't always take acting classes, but I work at my craft every day. Uh, I'm learning new material. Whatever it is, an ongoing, and I've taken acting classes for, for years with various people that I like to work with or that I've learned from. But the getting started is you need to understand what the business is like. And then you have to have, I've always said, someone told me, you need a list. You need a list of people you work with, but if you're starting out, maybe you haven't worked with very many people. Sure. You have a list of, say, your top 10 or more, people you want to work with, a list of people you have worked. And every three months or so, you need to contact those people. That's great advice, right? And a, and a great statement to make. But we both know, or we all know, <laughs> it's not as easy to do as, as it is to plan, right? Right. How, how do you contact these people? How well, do you get past the gatekeeper? That's, it's, it's always a problem. You, you get your list of, say, producers, directors, casting directors. In the beginning, you write letters, you send postcard, you, you find their address or their company address or studio address. Their, I don't know if I can mention things like that sure. on some, but there's Actors Access. They have a list of uh, casting director books. If you go to Samuel French or any of the theatrical bookstores, they have various lists. Uh, I, I can recommend or not recommend some. You have to explore with that and find the people that you want, the thing, kind of things you would be cast in, for example. The shows, watch the credits, who casts it, who directs it, who produces. You need to contact, those people need to know who you are. And of course, since they're besieged, there are lots of people protecting them. Sure. But you have to find a way to break through that, to introduce yourself in a, 
in a respectful way of their time and find out what it is that you can, how you can help them. Because confidence in this business is a huge factor. Especially for an actor. I mean, if you don't have the confidence and the presence, yes. the screen presence. They often, so. I, I feel, this is an opinion, I often feel, I've come to feel that they are attracted to confidence because there's so much money involved. Right. They don't have time. If you come in and you're, uh, well, how do you want it? You want this? That? No. Uh, my advice would be, <laughs> this is a sacrilege in a way, you take control of the audition in the sense this is my take. An actor should make, a, I think, a very strong choice. Even if it's not, don't spend a lot of time trying to figure out what they want. You have to figure out what you can do with it. And you bring a strong choice. Then they can say, I've, I've had this happen. Uh, <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's great, Patrick, but he's not like that. Right. He's like this. And then I make the adjustment and oftentimes I've gotten the job that way. So, so being able to take direction, obviously, is a very of course. good trait to have, right? And, and what I'm hearing is that you pretty much go ahead and, and you direct the scene in the audition the way you envision it, because at the end of the day, it doesn't even come down to the audition so much. And maybe you can well, talk about that a little bit, yeah. as, as it is of all these other elements that have to fall into place. If well, yes. you don't fit, with your leading or with, with your co-star, then they may cast oh, someone Oh, there's else. all these reasons why you don't get it. Exactly. And you can't right. control that. Yeah. The only thing you can control is you, how you present yourself. And that you, as I said, with confidence, because they respond to that. And they can say, well, make this adjustment. And you have to be able to do that, of course. But that's crucial because there are so many reasons why you don't get the role and you're, so often you don't know why. You go in and you do an incredible audition. You say, I nailed that. I, I booked that room. Right. And they don't, you don't get a call back. Right. And sometimes you can go in and you do an audition and you say, well, I was off and I yeah. didn't quite, and you'll get the job. Sure. Now, my, my advice to that is, I had an old voiceover actor once advise me when I was doing some voiceover. And behind the glass, you see the producers, you do a take and you see them talking and you say, as a young actor, you say, oh God, they hate what I did, I'm doing terrible. And this old actor said, no. He said, what you have to do is when you see them talking back there and you can't hear you saying, they're saying, he's great, he's wonderful. Let's do a this, that. Because don't guess yourself out of it. You have to keep your confidence. Positive thinking. Positive thinking. Yeah. And of course, you have to be open to change and you have to be flexible. But they're looking for confidence, not arrogance. I don't mean that. No, I'm not Mr. Know-it-all or anything, but confidence and then flexibility. And the first thing is, <laughs> I always say to actors, be on time, never be late. <laughs> right. Time is money. Sure. Of In course. the film and television, yeah. every minute is... Thousands of dollars. Tens of thousands, sure. I was yeah. in one where an actor went off to, he didn't like the coffee at the uh, craft services. He walked, went across the street to Starbucks. In the meantime, he didn't tell an AD right. or anyone where he was going. They wanted him on set. 15 minutes of running around, that's thousands of dollars. He was lucky to keep his job. Oh, wow. That was terrible. Anyway, that's... Well, look, tell me, tell me, we only have a few minutes left. Tell me, tell me about your projects. What's, what's uh, happening for you next? Actors are always looking for work and always <laughs> developing their things. Right now, I have, in the spring, I've been uh, cast in a, a new series. It's like, like Band of Brothers, uh, Pacific, it's, uh, but about the Civil War. Oh, wow, that's great. Uh, it's called Two Appomattox. It's, there's not who's, it's, that's just the name. I don't know exactly when they say the spring. That uh, I'm excited about because I, one of the best roles I've had in film was I played uh, the Confederate General John Bell Hood in the film Gettysburg and Gods and Generals. And in this day and age, if you're a journeyman actor, you know, your friends see your performance and congratulate you, but you don't know much. And I did a biker film in Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania a couple of years ago and I, I, I wanted pictures. I didn't take any pictures and the crew, everybody was under 25. He says, well, do you have any pictures? And they said, 
well, get on Facebook. We're going to put it on Facebook. And I said, face what? <laughs> Eventually, I got on Facebook. Right. And the next thing I knew, every day, I got I had fans. Sure. I didn't know I had Civil War fans, mostly sure. Civil, Civil War reenactor fans who I love and, uh, and I'm really honored to be. But so I have a fan base from, from Facebook. Exactly. You know, I resisted joining Facebook for a long time, for a long time. <laughs> and then finally I, I broke out. I had, to, I had to do it. Everybody's on Facebook. Well, days. you know, it, it, it's neat. It was, yeah. For me, it was great. But that's a, that's a project that I'm looking forward to. And uh, it's, it's always in this business, you know, my personal motto is, it's always now and it's never too late. <laughs> because in my career, I'm still looking for that breakthrough career-making role that will right. make my career. <laughs> I, I've done good work, I've done some great work even. Right. But I haven't had that role, I'm still looking for it. Well, we're gonna say a prayer for you so that you can <laughs> get your breakthrough role yes and but you've done so many great things and and we really appreciate you coming to aspiring hollywood and and sharing all this great knowledge and advice with with our viewers and at some time we talk more about the young actors and what they have to do because there's a lot of things they need to address when they come the newcomer right but I, and you know about that sure certainly well and i think it's great what you're doing well, thank you so much. I appreciate it again. And thank you guys for watching. Please follow Patrick Gorman's career on the big screen and, and on television. And also new media, the internet. So please visit us again at AspiringHollywood.com and watch our YouTube channel as well. Thank you again. I'm Luciano Saber. Until next time.